All right, so we're going to get started. Um, we're going to turn, if you could go in your Bible to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And I'll tell you why, because I know we've been in Revelation a bit, and some of these, some of these verses have come up. But this is something in particular that uh, I got a huge blessing out of, and so I turned, it, I turned it into a message to share with everybody. But I just want to read something in Revelation chapter 4, and uh, then we'll go ahead and pray. So Revelation chapter 4 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which much must be hereafter. And I immediately was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Father God, I just thank you again for the opportunity I thank you mostly that you showed me some really interesting things, encouraging things in your word, Lord. And so I, I took that and I tried to make a message, Father, uh, to pass on what you showed me. And so, Father, this is a message from you. It's not from me. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would have the freedom to move amongst the congregation and deliver the message you have for each of us here today. I pray, Lord, that if there's something I was going to say that I shouldn't, that you would cause me to forget it. And if there's something important that I missed, I pray you would bring it to mind so that I can include it. But I pray that everything today would be for your glory, Father. And I just thank you for, again, for the opportunity. I pray for safety for Pastor. I think of all the others, all the many, many prayer requests and, and the stuff we talked about today, Lord. But we know you're still up there on the throne. You're still in charge. I just pray, Lord, that you would do something wonderful and bring about a healing, and bring glory to yourself. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So I was looking at this, and um, you know, to be quite honest, uh, it's a depressing time sometimes to live in, to see things going the way that they are. Uh, not that I'm depressed, but I'm just saying when people feel a little down, I can understand it because it's a kind of an awful time. Um, granted, it may not be the most awful time, for Christianity. I mean, certainly the early days of Christianity were pretty rough. Nobody's throwing us into uh, coliseums and turning lions loose on us, you know, to tear us apart. I mean, so I, I'm not trying to say this is the worst it's ever been, uh, but it's, it's a rough time. It's a shame to see things that go bad so quickly. It's a shame to see the world make the decisions they do, uh, and it's ju it just hurts when you think about God and, and you're trying to honor him and you think about all he's done, even for the people that don't appreciate it, um, all he's done and, and, and how the things of God are disparaged and they're seen as a source of evil in their eyes. You know, they're calling good evil and evil good type thing. 
And, and so it's, it's, it's disappointing. And so I, I decided um, that I wanted to look at the verses around this, and I, and I ended up just doing some reading in Revelation. And uh, it, it just really meant something to me to read through this passage of Scripture and hear about these things. And I started thinking about uh, some of this. I mean, it was encouraging for me. I would encourage you to just read through Revelation. Just read about heaven, right? What we're, what's going on up there, what it's about, what we're going to see. Try to get an idea for what is going to happen next, you know? Because I, I, as I talked about in the previous uh, Sunday school lesson, we spend a lot of time thinking about now because this is what we know. I mean, I've been alive for 56 years, and this is all I know down here. Uh, I mean, I only know about heaven and things like that from what I'm able to read in Scripture, but it's not like living it for 56 years, right? So this is what I know, and I find it comforting to get my my mind on heavenly things and get it out of what's going on down here. Just as a way to remind me, I made a comment one time when things were going particularly bad, and many people have made the comment, I didn't originate it, certainly, but I said, hey, I, I skipped to the end of the book and I see how it's gonna turn out and everything's gonna be fine, right? And, and I just meant that because at the time it just seemed like everything was falling apart and I'm just trying to say, we don't need to worry about it. It's going to turn out okay. We, if we, of all people, we have the ability to skip to the end of the book and see what's going to happen, right? Other people, I don't know how people who aren't Christians get through life. Uh, well, number one, it's a miserable life that they live. They're always upset about something. And I guess if I thought that everything had to be made right here <laughs> in this life, I guess I'd probably be upset all the time too. Because at a certain point you realize you're not going to be able to fix it. No matter what you do, no matter how much effort you put in, no matter how hard you try, there's only so much that can be done in your lifetime. Right? Not saying a person doesn't, can't make a difference, because certainly they can, but everything can't be fixed. And so all these people that think they're going to make everything right by just um, recognizing the people that have been downtrodden in society and lifting them up ahead of the oppressors and stuff like that. You think you're going to fix that? You're not going to fix it. You know? You're going to be angry your entire life because of all these perceived injustices in the world. These social justices, as they call them. Because they're never going to be fixed. So, if you don't have Jesus, then in this life you're most miserable. You're not doing well. You're not going to be a happy person. So I like to go and look and see, and I'm looking forward to this a lot. I'm looking forward to the millennium. I'm looking forward to a government run by God. Amen. Isn't that going to be something? Isn't it be something to not have to worry about somebody just politically trying to maneuver this and that to make certain things happen for their own best interest? It's going to be about, no, God gets to decide and the right thing's going to happen. Now, I, I'm not naive. I know that with that, some people are going to be disappointed because we don't always want the right thing to happen. Sometimes we want the most advantageous thing to happen for us. Sometimes we're not willing to look at ourselves in that mirror and see the truth. But it's still, in all, it's going to be better in those times. And so I like to look at and read about these things. And uh, I was thinking about Pastor talking about that Revelation 4.11 being a key verse, and it is. But to me, it's a key verse for a different reason than what he's saying, even though it's, it's kind of tied in. It's, you know, that verse is pretty simplistic. And it was about, I was considering the topic of worthiness. The topic of worthiness. And uh, I call this message, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Because we live in that world of entitlement, which comes from an overestimation of our value. And I could preach a message on that, right? We could look at Psalms 14, 1 through 3, Romans 3, 10, Isaiah 64, 6, Job 44, Romans 7, 18, you know, there's an unrighteous. Now, we could go through all the verses about how terrible mankind is, right? Uh, but this message isn't about us. 
I, I heard that, that there's a, a church somewhere where they have a sign, and they have it up on the pulpit, and it says, it's not about you, yeah. it's about Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I kind of like that. But this message isn't about us, um, because, and, and as hard as it is for modern man to imagine in an age of selfies, right? Uh, blogs, uh, Instagram and Twitter, which basically, I mean, the whole point <laughs> of a blog, Instagram, Twitter, selfies, that, that's all saying it's all about us. That's, that's what that really is. That, it really has no other purpose. Why does Facebook exist? To reinforce that it's all about you. Otherwise, people wouldn't say, hey, look what I had for dinner. Look where I went. And, and I'm, there are good uses, right? I mean, I'll admit it. I, we've got family in Texas. We've got family in Ohio. We've got family in Missouri. And it's nice to see what the family's up to. So it's not all bad, but most of, if you look at what the tendency is for somebody that spends a lot of time on Twitter, Facebook, that kind of thing, is it kind of develops this carefully crafted image that we try to portray to others uh, about how we want people to think of us. It's a curated image, and it's about us, and that's why I don't like them. So in, in that age, it's difficult to talk about the worthiness of God and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Because it goes against everything that, that we believe and everything in that, the way we are, natural man, I should say. You know, in Isaiah 57, 15, it said, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. I mean, think about that statement. The high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Just consider the eternity part of it. Time doesn't matter anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Whose name is whose name is holy. And the holy's capitalized. I love that. The name of God is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. I mean, God's up there over all this stuff. He knows what's going on. He sees what's happening down here. He sees how the world is changing. I mean, we should still pray because Abraham prayed and got God to do some things to, you know, tweak his mind a little bit. I mean, we looked at Ahab who humbled himself and because of the way he humbled himself, God's judgment was pushed off to later in his family instead of falling on him. So God listens, but he's up there and he sees what's going on and he's going to take care of everything. We don't have to worry about it. He is worthy of our trust in him to take care of things. If we were good to go to the next chapter in Revelation chapter 5, uh, I'm going to read this one as well because the first one we were looking about how God is worthy. In Revelation chapter 5, picking up in verse 4, I love this. It says, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Isn't that the truth? I sometimes feel like I'm not even worthy to look at the book. I mean... I just feel so unworthy. This word is living word. It's not like anything else I've ever read. But this was in heaven. The book was sealed and nobody was worthy to open it. And verse five, and one of the elders saith unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of old odors which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. 
and has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now I'll tell you what, I can't think about that. I can't read these things and not be lifted up. You know, I, I can't. I can't read these things about God getting glory, about Jesus Christ getting, you know, being pronounced worthy being recognized for his worthiness, which is so different from what we experience in this world now without being uplifted by that, without feeling better. And it's a great way to handle it when you don't feel like things are going well or when you're feeling a little down. It's kind of like I heard somebody say one time, have you ever had like a creepy skin crawling feeling like there's just something wicked or evil and you can't put your finger on it but it just doesn't feel right and he goes just sing a hymn you know that works start giving god glory because those evil things don't want to have anything to do with that they want to be they're out they want to be gone you know well you got to be saved first i'm not trying to say if you're an unsaved person if you were being tormented, that you could sing him. I mean, I don't know what would happen in that case. Get saved first. <laughs> Get saved first. But for those of us that are saved, just giving God the glory, because we can't do anything about it anyway. You know, I, there have been times when I thought, when I think about our ability to see, and I think uh, there's a lot of spiritual stuff going on around us, and I'm interested, but I'm kind of glad I can't see it, because I don't want to see all the evil. I don't want to see the wickedness, the influence of the wicked. If there's wicked spirits around me trying to trip me up or cause me trouble or get me angry or ruin my day so that I'll blow my testimony or won't do something I'm supposed to do, I kind of don't want to see them. I, I mean, I know that it would be great to see the angels and stuff there. You know, and like when uh, they opened the eyes uh, and you could see all around them, you know, the angels that were there to, to, with them and say, them that be uh, with us are more than that are against us. I mean, that would be kind of cool. But then I would also see all the wicked stuff around. I'd kind of rather not, you know. They're, you know, do you want your kids to know when they're little about all of the trouble in the world that they're going to experience when they get older? You want to let them be a kid and just enjoy things and not have to think about how someday they're going to have to get a job and they're going to have to have insurance and they're going to have all these bills and all this stuff. We want to protect them and let them live as children. I'm kind of happy for God. God made the decision for me to not be able to see that stuff. I'm good with it. I don't need to be able to see it. Uh, but I like to be able to envision these things going on in heaven where finally he's getting the due, where understanding that God is worthy and Jesus Christ is worthy. And it's easy for me to say that because I wouldn't be here if God wasn't worthy because it was his worthiness that made him look for me. Otherwise, I'd still be dying and going to hell. I wasn't looking for God. He came looking for me. God and Jesus are worthy. I think about that worthy name. In James chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Do not they blaspheme, James 2, 7, Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called. Isn't that the truth? They blaspheme that worthy name. Do you ever wonder why people don't swear by Buddha? Or Confucius. Because men only swear by the greater. That's right. 
because even the world knows whether they'll admit it or not that there's power in some names. You know, let me read you a verse just by illustration from the Bible. A uh, story about when Peter and John were out preaching and they, and they got in trouble, they got arrested and they get hauled before the council for preaching at the temple. And it says, and it came to, this is Acts 4, 5, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them, Peter and John, in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? You know, the world understands there's power in a name. They know it. Say, oh, by whose name do you do this? Well, I do this by President Biden's name. I do this by, I don't know, you know, at work. Says, well, who told you we'd do this? Oh, well, you know, and I'll mention the name of my boss. My boss told me to do this. Oh, okay. All of a sudden now it's different. By what name? The world knows that there's power in some names. So whether they want to admit it or not, they know there's power in the name of God or they wouldn't use it for their curses when they want to call a curse on something. Nobody says, Buddha damn anything. Nobody says Confucius damn anything. Why? Because they can't. They don't have any power. Right? If they're going to call a curse on something, they're going to use the most powerful name that they can to call that curse because even if they won't admit it, there's power in that name. You know, some Jews won't even speak God's name for fear of a commandment. In Exodus 20, verse 7, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So they won't even use the name of God. <laughs> they come up with other ways to refer to God because they don't want to be guilty of that verse. They understand the power of the name. God's son's name is important. In Philippians 2, 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, from all that stuff there, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Jesus Christ has a name above every name. Don't they use that for a curse word now? I mean, it's upsetting what they do. Let's, let's see just how important it is. Here's now. This is now. Think of now. If you want to write something next to Philippians 2.10, write now. Philippians 2.10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. At the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee should bow. But later... Romans 14, 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall, shall, shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So right now, every knee should bow. Later, every knee shall bow. So those people, I often wondered, I mean, I have this weird sense of humor. If you were somewhere and someone was using Jesus' name as a curse word, if you didn't say anything, you just went like this. What are you doing? Well, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That's what I'm doing. And, every, and then they use it again. Well, nah, nah, nah. and then you bow again. Bow the knee. What are you doing? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And, then, and he said, I'll tell you what, right now you're using it as a curse word, but 
The day's coming when your knees are going to bow too. You have a choice how you're going to use the name of Jesus right now, but later on, you don't get a choice anymore. It's going to change. That's the later. Those people that use God's name and Jesus' name as a curse word. What are they thinking? I mean, at least they recognize there's power in that name. But what are they thinking using it like that? What are they thinking? And then when God someday forces them, it says every knee shall bow. That doesn't mean that they're going to want to. It doesn't matter what they want at that point. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue is going to confess too, by the way. You know, Christ is the Savior of sinners. It says in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying in worthy, this is a worthy saying of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's a worthy saying. So we've got God that's worthy in heaven. We've got Jesus that's worthy. They've got a worthy name, and now we're looking at a worthy saying. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief, Paul said. But Jesus Christ came in to save sinners. That's a worthy saying. What's a worthy saying? I mean, there's all kinds of quotes people love to use. You know, I, I think of this thing, you have to be, I guess, a little older to pick up on this, but some of you might remember this, depending on what you listen to. Uh, for some reason, I remember being a kid, and I remember being in the living room, and the TV being on, and I remember hearing this, this uh, it was like some kind of a country show, I think it was called Hee Haw. And uh, they were singing, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Uh, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony. I still remember that. That's a saying that I have in my head. But you know what? That's not a worthy saying. You know what a worthy saying is? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's a worthy saying. And if it's a worthy saying, then why don't we say it more? <laughs> why don't we say it? Why don't we put it up? I mean, wouldn't that be a great thing to have or, you know, in, your, in your house somewhere? You know, just up on a plaque somewhere just to remind you? Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Just a reminder, it's a worthy saying. Uh, you know, we trust in the living God, the Savior of all men. We put our trust in Him. Let's look at something else. In 1 Timothy 4, 8, it says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy, another worthy saying, of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we, why? Because we trust in the living God. We labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So if you thought, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could say that. You say, Therefore, we both labor and suffer approach because we trust in the living God. I kind of feel like it's us bragging. Say, you can do what you want to me. My trust is in the living God. I've got something that I trust in. I don't know what you're putting your trust in. The credit card, the cash, the bank account. I don't know. The big army, you know, the government behind you. Maybe you want to put your trust in that. But I put my trust in the living God, who's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. That's somebody to put your faith and trust into. Isn't that a worthy saying? I mean, wouldn't it be a worthy saying to have someone come up to you and say, hey, with all this stuff going on, aren't you worried about what's going on? And you go, no, not really. Not really. I'm not really worried about it. Well, why not? Because I trust in the living God, who's the Savior of all men especially of those that believe. So what have I got to worry about? God didn't fall off the throne. He's still up there. We're good. Say, well, what if you get COVID and you end up on a ventilator in the hospital and die? Well, that doesn't mean God stepped off the throne. It means that's what he wanted me to do. And if, if that's the mission he wants to send me on, I'm good with it. 
No problem. I mean, we remember that it says in, in Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's not possible. And then pair that up with Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you want to have faith? If you, if you can't please God without faith, then man, I need more faith. How do you get more faith? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. By the Bible. That's where your faith comes from. Spend some time in it. You want to get lifted up? You want to be fueled up to do what you should do? Then hear the word of God. You know, um, people are, it, it's kind of crazy to think this. We're so busy. We're so busy. We've got so much stuff going on. Um, but I'll tell you what, we live in a time when we're all real busy, but we're living in a time that'll help us even overcome that. You, you want to get more Bible reading in? You can read, by, you can have a, I mean, nowadays, man, your phone, you can put a Bible on your phone. You're sitting, waiting for the kids to come out of the school or at the store, or you're in line. Man, you could whip out your phone, you could be reading the Bible in a second. You are driving from one place to another. You can get a Bible on MP3 and you can listen to the Bible while you're driving or listen to a preaching message. I mean, we're busy, but there are also all these extra things that nobody ever had before. Wouldn't David have been excited to be able to hear preaching all the time, as, much, as often as he wanted, about proclaiming how great a God he, he has and, and listen to the Bible being read to him whenever he wanted, anywhere he was at? I mean, he would have loved to have that. And it's at our fingertips, no big deal. We can listen to it. I mean, you don't, you don't even have to pay for it. When I talk about listening to the Bible, it's free, open source, on the web. You can listen to the King James Bible being read for nothing. Won't cost you a dime. You don't have to buy anything. And if you wanted to buy it, it wouldn't even cost you that much if you wanted something particular. But you can listen. You could always listen to the Bible if you wanted to. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you want to please God? Surround yourself in it. Hang up the scripture verses around your house. Why? Because he's worthy. And it's a worthy saying. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's so simple. I mean, it changed your outlook on everything. Music lyrics. Uh, a lot of people know music lyrics. Why? Because it's easy to remember. It's a worthy thing. I'll tell you what, if you listen to enough Bible, just listening to it in the background, you don't even have to be, it's not like I'm saying, turn on the listening and 100% focus and you're taking notes as they're saying. You can do that too. But just have it on in the background. You know, have, just have it on. You'll start picking up on things. Next thing you know, I love it. I love it. I always wanted to get to the point, but I love it now how when a preacher's up, and he's preaching on a verse, and he takes you like 60% through the verse and then stops, and you can finish the verse because you just know it. It's just in your head. That's awesome. Maybe you guys don't. Maybe I'm a dork for thinking that. But I think that's awesome, right? Because it shows that it's inside of me. The Holy Spirit can go, oh, yeah, you know that verse. It's this, you know? And I'm not saying it's me because, again, God could have uh, said that I would have been born without the mental faculties to be able to do some of this stuff. I've considered a gift that God allows me to remember anything. I mean, people get older and they start forgetting everything about their life. That's not me right now, at least. So I'm thankful. I don't want to be at the point to where I've lost something before I finally realize that I should have been thankful for it all along. I want to be thankful for it now. So I'm going to end it with a question. Are we worthy, are we worthy of his calling? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'll let you turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, because we're going to end with this passage. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 11 and 12. It says, Wherefore, also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we're worthy, we're glorifying God. Right? We glorify God by being worthy. And say, what do we do when we're being worthy? We're doing what we're supposed to do. You know, um, praising our worthy God. Praise him for being worthy. Uh, Do we honor that worthy name? Do we honor it? Do we proclaim his worthy sayings? You know, we can praise God by telling people about him. Just think about it. If you've got somebody like, uh, you know, if you're, if you're just particularly, you know, if you had kids, it might be that your kid's an awesome football player, maybe. I don't know, or volleyball or something like that. And you're like telling everybody, oh, man, my kid is so good at football. You should see him out there on the field. Nobody can touch him. He can zig and zag and get around. You know, what are, what are they doing? You're bragging on <laughs> your kid, you know, and you're basically praising your kid. We brag on God? Oh, man, I would have been nothing. I mean, and this is the truth for me. I mean, I, people maybe wonder if I really mean this. No, you'd have to have known me when I was a kid. I mean this when I say, I don't know what I would have been if I wouldn't have got saved, but I certainly wouldn't be here. Because my life changed 100% when I got saved. I am nothing like the thieving, lying, worldly person that I was when I got saved at I think it was 12 or something, 13 years old. I completely changed because of that. Everything I know about studying is because I learned how to study the Bible. And everything I know about speaking is because I learned about preaching and witnessing and stuff like that. Everything I know about everything is because of God. So I am nothing like I would have been if I wouldn't have got saved. So I, to me, it's no big deal bragging on God. Why am I good at taking notes? Because I got saved and I wanted to know more about God. And I lived in a house where nobody went to church. And so I didn't hear anything about God from my family. So if I wanted to know more about God, I thought, well, I'll just read my Bible. And then I'll make notes and mark it up so that I know some things. And I can know more about this Jesus guy that saved me from my sins that I had just heard about or you know, made the connection and got saved. So I had the ability and I learned to read and take notes and comp- reading comprehension, probably because of, I wanted to know more about Jesus Christ and what I should be doing. You also, not by just bragging on, but by doing things for him. When, you, when I go to work, my goal is, when I go to work every day, is to remember that I'm not working for my company, I'm not working for my boss, that I'm working for God because my goal is to be different enough that people ask me why and give me an opportunity to witness to them. That's my goal. And so every little thing I do at work is for him. You know how you get attention at work? Work hard, get things done, do the stuff other people don't want to do, volunteer. You know, if if you were in the office and they said, hey, um, we had to let the cleaning person go, I'll clean the toilet. I don't have a problem with that. I'll do it. And then do it. Why? Because you just want to do things. You know, for God, I'll clean God's toilets. I don't care in heaven. It doesn't matter to me. You know, I'll, you know it, what, what's that verse? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Mm-hmm. Just the guy opening the door to let people in. That's, I'm good by that. Whatever you need, God, whatever you need, I'm good. Just let me know. I'm happy to do it. You do things. When you do things for pastor, when you do things for the church, when you do things in service for each other, you're following Jesus' example. He washed the disciples' feet. So when you, know, when you come in and you pick up or 
hey, I'm going to help sweep, or I'm going to bring some flowers, or I'm going to bring some treats, or, or whatever, whatever you do. There isn't one thing that's better. If you're doing it because you're doing it for God, then it's good. Pass out a tract. You're bragging on God. The small things, encouraging one another, praying for one another. Work, but do it for him. Because remember, he's worthy. He's worthy. God's worthy. Jesus is worthy. We should be worthy. We should be saying those worthy sayings. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and the privilege, really the privilege, God, that you would take somebody like me <laughs> um, that did the things I did when I was a kid and just was stupid and just ignorant and just no good. You took someone like me, God, and you, you pulled me out of that mess and you changed my life, God, in a way that I, I, I can't even comprehend. I, I, can no, I no longer even recognize what I was like before salvation. And I'm glad that I don't. And I, do th and I have more than I ever could have wanted. And, I, and it's just, it's been wonderful. God, you've been so good to me. You've been so good to us. And God, I just pray that we would all be so much more thankful and offer so much more praise for you as our worthy God and for Jesus as our worthy Savior. And your word, which is full of worthy sayings. And I, got, I pray, God, that you would help us to find opportunities to praise you in the things that we do every day. And God, I pray that we could be worthy, that we could be worthy, which will just bring glory to you, which is really all we want. God, I pray that we would find the opportunities to hear your word, to listen, to have that faith so we can please you and to do the right things. And God, we give it all to you and we're thankful for all of it in Jesus Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. All right, so no third service today. My challenge is just think about these things and try to find something that you can do that we can find a way to magnify God. I've got this fun thing I do. Now it's a blast. When I first thought of it, I was actually trying to come up with a way to overcome how hard it is to give somebody a track. You know how hard it is to get someone to take a track out of your hand? It is hard. Um, so now, and, I, and I do, I'm not a big fan of McDonald's or, or stuff like that, but I look forward to going through the drive-thru at McDonald's now because every time I go through McDonald's, I have, an, I have a Ziploc bag in the car and I've got, I put two tracks together and I put a dollar bill in there. And then I go through and I'll buy a dollar drink, I don't care, just so that I can give them a tract at the window. And then I go to, the, to pay pay the money, here, something for you. And they always take it, always. And then when I go to the next window where I pick it up, I got another one ready. What a, what a great use. I've done a lot of stupid things with $2 in my life, but I guarantee you that's a good use for $2, right? Uh, because they take it and they say, thank you, <laughs> amen. You know what I mean? There's nothing better than that. So I, I mean, and I'm, I'm, look, I'm trying to find the next thing. I love that. I want to keep ones and tracks in my, in my car for that very reason. So don't break into my car. You'll get a bunch of money. Not a bunch, but you'll get some. Um, you know, I, hey, you know what? Someone break into my car. I hope they take my bag of tracks with the ones in it. I really do. <laughs> that wouldn't be so bad either, right? But I'm looking for that next thing because I just, it makes me happy. Giving somebody the gospel, that makes me happy. And uh, I'm looking for another way to do it. Um, I actually had somebody one time, they asked me when I was in the drive-thru at Taco Bell, they go, they go, are you a pastor somewhere? And I said, no. Nope. <laughs> I said, but I said, I preach sometimes and I hand out gospel tracts and stuff like that. I just thought it was, it made me feel good that someone asked me if I was a pastor just because, I don't know, because they evidently they saw something different enough. I hadn't just handed them a tract, by the way. That just happened. Something had happened. Maybe they saw me on the street corner. I don't know. But I appreciate if someone looks at me and says, I wonder if that guy's 
a Christian. I wonder if that guy is a preacher. I wonder if that guy is a... And I'm looking for things to do. As a matter of fact, it's, it's even making me think, maybe I should dress different when I go out so that I can be a better witness. Because I had someone tell me, hey, with your beard like that, when you street preach, you wear like a tie, don't you? And I said, yeah, because <laughs> I do. And they go, you don't want to look like those the end is near guys. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're done. I just, it was just something that occurred to me. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time today.